everyone. Welcome, welcome to First Baptist Church Play Center. If you're visiting with us this morning, we welcome you. Hope you're blessed as we are with your presence. What a wonderful morning we can get together, we can worship God, and we can also celebrate the birth of our country. Uh, announcements have been on the, on the screen. I'd um, like to call your attention to several of them. Again, text prayer request to pastor if you'd like those mentioned during worship service this morning. Also, you can text him for a personal visit if you have that request. We need volunteers. Children's Church, Nursery, and Greeters. You can contact the office. Also on the bulletin, this it's winding down. You're losing your chances to come, to uh, submit your favorite hymns, so that won't last much longer, that opportunity. So uh, if you have some favorite hymns you'd like to submit, put that in the offering plate as you leave. Or you can turn it into the office. 24 hours of prayer sign up. Uh, that, that will happen July 23rd and 24th in anticipation of VBS. Sign-up sheet is back by the office. You can sign up for the time slot that you want, assuming it's available. You can come here to the church and pray, or you can pray from wherever you're at. Next Saturday evening from 6 to 9 is our block party right outside here. Um, if you would like to volunteer and haven't made that known yet, there's still opportunities. It's going to be a fun time. We'll have free food. We'll have games. We'll have lots of things that you can you can participate in. It's a good time for us to meet people outside the four walls of this church and uh, maybe uh, make an impact on their lives. Sunshine Challenge. We have a large number of people on our prayer request in the bulletin. If you might, this week, take a moment to give them a call, send a text, send a card. Just whatever, just let them know that you're thinking of them, a little word of encouragement. Also, Mariah and Michael Brinkman were married last December. They're going to have a reception July the 31st. It is an RSVP event. You'll meet to RSVP by July 15th, and the number is there in the bulletin. I don't know if there's anything else, any other announcements that need to be made that you not. Know? If not, we have a video to show before we have our hymn of worship. From the Rio Grande de Maine, 
my heart cries out, my pulse runs fast, the mind of her domain. You ask me why I love her? I have a million reasons why. My beautiful America, beneath God's wide, wide sky. God in the United States of America, as inseparable today as they were back in 1776. Now if you'd stand, we'll sing our hymn of worship this morning, God Bless the USA. Your will upon the leadership of our country. 
and that we might be drawn closer and closer to you each and every day. We, things we ask in Jesus' name we pray. Scripture this morning is out of 2 Chronicles, chapter 7, verses 12 through 18. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or to send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by not my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. As for you, if you walk before me as your father David walked and do according to all that I have commanded you, and if you keep my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom as I have covenanted with David your father, saying, you shall not fail to have a man as ruler in Israel. Our hymn of uh, praise this morning is God of Our Fathers. It was written in 1866 by an Episcopalian priest in honor of the 100th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. So it's appropriate this morning. that have been shared and ask that you would work according to your will uh, in these situations. We continue to pray for our friend uh, Greg White and ask that as he continues um, to deal with his health situation, Lord, that you give him strength and encouragement. We're thankful Danny is here and he's doing well and pray that you continue to strengthen and encourage him. And we pray the same for Patricia Talbot, Lord. We're so thankful that she is here and ask that you just continue to bless and strengthen and encourage her. We pray for Joe McMillan, who's been battling cancer, and ask, Lord, that your hand would be upon him, that you would give him strength and encouragement. We pray for the Seifert family, uh, that you would watch over them, that you would guide and direct, that you would protect, and that you would bring healing um, to little baby Jack. Lord. We pray for Shirley Davis, a relative of uh, Rebecca Linder, uh, who is hospitalized, and we pray, Lord, that your hand of peace and comfort and healing would be with Shirley this day. And Lord, we do pray for the Eccles family and ask that you would just bless and work in that situation according to your will, Lord. 
And again, Lord God, we just thank you and praise you for all the ways that you do work in our lives. And so often, uh, your hand is unseen. And Father, we just pray that you would help us to recognize uh, as you work in our life. And we pray too for the unspoken requests that haven't been shared today, that you would work in that, again, according to your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And now we invite the choir to come and sing as they share a patriotic medley. And you know, patriotic songs are ones that we all know. And just as Jim comes up here, you'll notice that it's just Jim and I. So if any of you brave men feel like today is the day you want to join the choir. No? Okay. I thought I'd try. Robin has another announcement. Well, good morning. It's so nice to see all these.
these beautiful faces this morning. I'd like to take this opportunity just wholeheartedly to thank all of you who have signed up to help us with the blog party. How much we appreciate each and every one of you and your giving hearts. It, it touched my heart just immensely. In figuring everything out, we came up just a little bit shy on some cookies. So if there's anyone today here who could possibly make two dozen cookies, if you could see me after church, uh, we are providing the baggies that we'd like you to put the cookies in. So if you made two dozen, we're going to have you put two cookies in each one of the baggies. And if I had three more people, we would feel very confident that we will have enough. So if you're able to help with that, I would greatly appreciate it. And then again, to all of you who have already volunteered to help with games or provide the cookies or to help just bring, bring items that we needed, just thank you. Thank you so very much. What a wonderful, wonderful family we are here. And uh, you really touched my heart, so thank you. Well, thank you, Robin, for that reminder. I'm not missing anything. All right. It's already time for the sermon. Yay, there we go. Well, today, I don't know if you noticed this, notice this is a special day for our nation, right? And I can see most of you got the memo because a lot of you are wearing red, white, and blue. And I had planned to wear a nice red shirt. I bought a new one, had it delivered to the house. Foolish as I was, and it was not red. It was supposed to be red, but it turned out to be not red at all. So it's going back, and I figured out I should have just gone over to Mayo's and got it from Jerry. Oh, you live and you learn. 245 years ago today, just three years after Vicki Wynn was born. <laughs> I sat in Sunday school with her today, and several times she referenced how old she was, so uh, we won't go there, though. But anyways, she's not quite 245 years, but that's all right. But 245 years ago, the United States of America declared their independence from the rule, not only of the British Empire, but from any other nation. And over the past 245 years, these past years, our nation, we know, like so many others, have experienced moments that have brought us great pride, and we've also had moments that we look back with regret. Ours is a nation that, despite the many uh, differences that exist among us as citizens, um, there is something that unites us. And it's not religion, it's not our ethnicity or our race, but rather the United States are the United States because of the shared beliefs that we have, the shared uh, values that we have, the shared truths that we recognize. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those are some of the beginning words of the Declaration of Independence for the United States of America. And in these first words of a nation, there was an, and there is a clear reference to God, the creator. Now, I know some in 2021... You know, they use clever phrasing and clever pausing and clever punctuation to avoid that word creator. And then there are others that like to rewrite the document and instead of using a capital C, they just put a small c. Again, to try to avoid that reference to God as our creator. They try to distance our nation from our creator. But the sad reality is that ours is not the first nation to seek to purposefully and to willfully walk away or turn away from God. We've seen it throughout history. Of course, just looking through the pages of the Bible, we see nations like Egypt, here or even Israel. And of course, as we look in our own history, 
uh, we can see other nations as well throughout the history of the world. But when a nation takes steps away from God, there are consequences. There are consequences to this. Now, last week, and I, I know, I, I, you know, I just teased Vicki, so I guess I'll praise her now. She, in Sunday school, said, remember last week in the sermon? And I was like, yeah, I was there. And, and she said, you were talking about this particular person, and she mentioned her name. And hopefully you remember that we talked about Rizpa and just the, the tragedy uh, that unfolded in her life. But last week we spoke of Rizpa and her heroic and quiet and influential love. But let us remember that Rizpah found herself in that situation because King Saul had broken trust with God. And as a result, the Gibeonites demanded the death of seven of Saul's relatives. Now, that passage that we looked at last week comes from the book of 2 Chronicles. It's the 20th chapter of 2 Chronicles. The context for those events, you'll remember, was that there was a famine that had gone on for three years. And the people who are trying to endure that famine and the sacrificing of these seven men was meant, or was the response really, that the Gibeonites had asked when David said, how could he end this? How could he fix this? How could he make up for this? This morning as we consider the Word of God, we look again at 2 Chronicles. But today we focus on 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. But the verse just before this really ties us back to what we see later when we see Rizpa. In verse 13, God says, When I shut up heaven and there's no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people. God's saying, when I do that, right? And then he goes on to verse 14. Well, when I do that, if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves, will pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their land, or forgive their sin and heal their land. God was preparing them. God was warning them. God was instructing them, very much like a parent. You know, a parent who might say, you know what? If you do what you're going to do, and you find yourself facing the consequences of those actions, this is what you're going to have to do in order to get yourself out of that mess. You know, now I'm sure all, our, all, all, everyone that's ever been a parent has probably, if you haven't said that, you've thought that. You know. Now, for some they look at this passage and they think, boy, God is cruel. God is so cruel that he's telling them, when I do this, that he's telling them that there's going to be negative consequences. But it's not a cruel statement at all. No, it's a statement of grace. God is telling them that in the face of the negative consequences brought about by their actions, their willful disobedience, that there is a path to restoration. There's a path to reconciliation. There's a path to reunion. And as 2 Chronicles 7, 14, in that we see this idea. And it's kind of stated in four ideas, you know, humbling ourselves, praying, seeking his face, and turning from our wicked ways, right? But it's not really four distinct different actions. It's really more four aspects of one heart attitude. All right? And though I make that, I just made that statement, you say, yep, yep, okay, fine, I'm, I'm right with you. It's four aspects of one heart attitude. Today we are going to take a look at one of these aspects. And in light of the fact that, that our nation, our United States of America, seem, seem ever more poised to make the mistake that so many nations have made in the past. It seems to be picking up its pace, running away from God. And so as we look to this passage to see God's instructions, God's encouragement as to how we might respond 
in this situation. So this morning, we begin with this phrase, the conditional phrase, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. If, you know. There's a lot of power in if. There's a lot of potential in if. And we're not just going to look at just the if today. We're not going to solely focus on that. We're also going to see the respond to this if. If, then, the conditional phrase is that if something happens, then this is going to happen, right? If you don't pay your electric bill, for example, what happens? <laughs> the power goes out. If you don't put gas in your car, what happens? It stops running at the corner of 6th Street and Anthony. Right over there, right? In this passage, we see four ifs, but there are also four thems. And the first then is, I, I, then I will hear from heaven. And so we see in this combination, humility and hearing. Humility and hearing. So first, humility is something that we've talked about before, right? We've discussed it many, many times in our Sunday school classes, in our worship services, in our care groups, hopefully in our devotions at homes, home, and it's a trait with which we as human beings and as Americans struggle. We struggle with humility. But the truth of it is, the main idea of it, the lesson of humility, comes right down to one simple thing, and that is choice. Amen. To be humble, unlike to be humiliated, is a choice. In many ways, being humble and being humiliated, very often we can find ourselves in the same uh, position but the emotions, the heart attitude, the response is quite different. To be humble is a choice to lower ourselves. You know, and of course, we don't live in a nation where they say, go out there, Irene, and lower yourself. We don't do that, right? We say we're going to pull ourselves up. <coughs> but it's a, it's a choice to lower ourselves. It's the decision to place ourselves under the authority or subjection of another. And in fact, there really is an idea of restraint associated with humility or being humble. And there's a fascinating word picture that we see in the Arabic version of this word. Now, our Bible, our Old Testament is in Hebrew. But as you know, very often, you know, when languages were developing, right about the time that Vicky was born, right, Vicky? Yeah, there you go. When the languages were developing, very often they kind of shared and they borrowed things and there's similar words. And when you, you know, especially if we see the Romance languages, they're very similar very often. And so this is kind of the case with the Hebrew and the Arabic. But the Arabic word for humble carries with it, and it's such a fascinating picture that beautifully demonstrates this idea uh, that we see in this passage particularly. But it's a, this idea, it's associated with, the, the picture is associated with a bird, right? Now, have you ever seen a bird, Greg? Once in a while, right. We've all seen birds, right? And we see them flying, right? Flying in the sky, except the poor penguins and the emus and ostrich. But they're out there flying in the sky with their wings stretched out wide, and they're soaring proudly and majestically. Well, with that image in mind, this word for humble carries with it this picture of the bird. But this time, the wings of this bird, they're not outstretched. They're not flying proud, no. The wings are contracted, and they're folded in and wrinkled. All right? And that is the picture of humility. That is the picture of being humble. It is a picture of instead. Instead of being outstretched, they are choosing to be constricted or contracted, contracted. 
And when we consider our relationship, when we consider our position before God, we must also demonstrate an instead type of mindset. As human beings, God gives us choice. He gives us free will. And we must demonstrate an instead attitude. When we make decisions, if we make decisions, especially if we're thinking about humbling ourselves, we must place ourselves under the authority of God. Or better, we must recognize that we are already under His authority and we must embrace it. Then there really is a shift. There's a change. Because we're not being forced into it, we're accepting it willingly. And we find ourselves entering into a united state with God. You like that play for the day, you know? Not United States like Kansas or the best state in the United States, Michigan. <laughs> yeah, that was an amen. <laughs> but united in the sense that we are now uh, experiencing unity with God. We are in a place where we are in agreement with God. We are in a place where we try to be of one mind or in one accord with God. That is the point of humility. That is the point of being humble. It's making the choice to bring ourselves into agreement, into unity with God. Making the choice to set aside our will, to set aside our mind, to set aside our desire to contract our wings. Why? Why would we do that? We do that because we are reminded of what Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9 reminds us, that God's ways are higher than ours. But as we look at this passage today, we see that there's a benefit in humbling ourselves, to bringing ourselves into agreement with God. There's a benefit. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, if my people bring, if, if, if we will bring ourselves under God's authority, set aside our will, set aside our desire, then it says, then I will hear from heaven. Amen. And this is really the same idea that we see in another Old Testament verse in Proverbs. Proverbs 15, verse 29 says, The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. He hears the prayer of the righteous. That sounds good, right? Now, when we read that word, or read that verse, the one word that we really kind of focus in on is that word righteous. And when we think about righteous, we always think, oh, well, that means we have to be perfect. You know, and that means that, well, this verse is saying, God, hears the prayer of those that are perfect. Well, that's not really what this verse is saying. Because if that was really what this verse was saying, God wouldn't hear too many prayers, would he? Now, there'll be so many out there will say, well, through the blood of Jesus, when God sees me, he sees me as perfect. And I say, hallelujah, amen to that. And you get a gold star, you can leave right now. But... <laughs> But as we think about this, the Hebrew word where we get our Old Testament English word righteous, it's connected with a different idea. It's connected, are you ready for it? It's connected with the ideas of weights and measures. Weights and measures. Things like we might say grams or liters or pounds or ounces, right? But it's associated with the idea of accuracy. You know? Accuracy, And we can think of it like this, you know, if Nancy Vesta and I were in the kitchen and she's whipping up something, we're making some cookies. I know it's probably not going to happen, but we're making some cookies and she says, Pastor Matthew, I need a cup of sugar. And if you've ever been in the kitchen, we have this little drawer that says sippy cups on it. So I decide, okay, I get a sippy cup, I open, I wash my hands nice and carefully and make sure they're all sanitized before doing anything. And then I take the cup and I dip it into the sugar bag and I hand her a cup of sugar. 
Is that what she's asking for? Now, if you like sweet cookies, then might it, well, it depends on how big that sippy cup is. But no, that's not what we think of. What do we do? We use a measuring cup. Imagine that, that we use a measuring cup to, to measure something. We use a measuring cup to get an accurate amount. If the recipe says one cup, we want to put in one cup. Now, the emphasis, though, in this word for righteous, although it kind of goes along with this, the emphasis is not simply on the accurate measurement. Okay, That's what we think of. We think of like the law. Here's the law. Here's the expectation. We want to live up to it. All right? But the emphasis, the greater point, the deeper point, is not just the accuracy, but it's the agreement. It's the unity that is demonstrated in that accuracy or in that rightness. Are you with me? You see, the point is not simply to look right or to act right or to appear right or to do the right thing, as is often the case. No, there's more to this truth. The righteousness, the rightness is meant to show the inner unity that we have, the spiritual agreement that we enjoy with God. Because again, what does the Bible tell us? As we saw when we studied Eliab a couple weeks ago, you all remember Eliab when we talked about him? That God looks on the inside. He doesn't look on the outside because how many of us know I can do the exact right thing, but my heart can have a totally different attitude. You know? I can hold the door open for every single one of you as you leave church today, and in the inside I can be going, will you pick it up? Come on, I got hot dogs waiting at home. You know? Aren't you glad we can't read each other's thoughts? I'm glad every Sunday as I give these sermons that I can't hear your thoughts. <laughs> Long-winded, yeah, you know? But you know what? You know who can hear my thoughts? God. And so that's why he doesn't just look at the measurement. It's what's in here. It's the attitude. It's the heart. And that's the whole idea, this idea of righteousness, of rightness. It's demonstrating the unity, demonstrating the agreement that we have with God. And so when we understand this, when we return to Proverbs 15, 29, and we read it, we can read it like this. God hears the prayers of those that are in agreement with them. And we see this idea over and over and over. The idea of agreeing with God, the idea of changing our attitudes, changing our actions, changing, changing ourselves to come into agreement with God, even Jesus himself. He said what? Not my will, but thine be done, or yours be done. And so as we look at 2 Chronicles, and as we look at Proverbs 15, we see a clear picture and a clear message. When we align ourselves with God, we are able to enter into a dialogue with Him more meaningfully. We are able to communicate with Him and He with us more meaningfully. Now for some, they'll say, well, hold on. This doesn't sound very fair to me, Pastor. You're telling me that in order to communicate with God, I have to agree with Him? Well, on one level, yes, that's what I'm telling you. But I want you to stop and think about it, because the same is true when we think about our attempts to have meaningful interactions or meaningful communication with other people. In fact, one of the main obstacles that we have in 2021 America is that there seems to be fewer and fewer and fewer things that we can agree on. Our leaders, past and present, have politicized everything that they can think to politicize to the point that any action or any comment can be seen and viewed through the political perspective and seen and viewed through political correctness. And so now we have to say trigger warning before we say this. Or we have to try to explain ourselves because of that. And so what could have meant just to be a, a loving, nice conversation or comment or compliment could be taken something as, for something it wasn't. But more than that, some within our society have moved so far away from the biblical truths that there is an ever-shrinking area of agreement for even discussing that. And this makes it more and more difficult 
for us to enter into meaningful exchanges of differences of opinion or thought. And instead, what do we end up doing? We have two opposing, diametrically opposing views, and all they do is clash. And we get to the point where we don't even talk anymore. And this can be how it is with God. But, if we're not careful, but while we don't know the ultimate end of our nation, we do know that God is God, and that He will continue to be God, and He will continue to be in control, even if we try to fool ourselves into believing otherwise. And so as we read 2 Chronicles 7 and Proverbs 15, we might ask ourselves, why would we want to be in agreement with God? And the answer is, that's the wrong question. The right question is, why would we want to not be in agreement with God? Or why would we want to be in disagreement with God? Looking back at 2 Chronicles, looking at that, the context of that, the people there, what? They were facing a famine because of disobedience, because of disagreement with God. Looking back in our own lives, I'm sure none of us have ever faced consequences when we made choices that disagree with God. And again, these consequences that we faced, they were of our own making. Let's not even try to play the game where we say, how could God do this? How could God let this happen? You know? When we willingly stray from God, when we willingly turn from God, when we, really di when we willingly disagree with Him or willingly reject Him, the consequences should only and can only be laid at our own feet. It's true as an individual and it's true as a nation. You know, every time we find ourselves in trouble, we look to God and say, why? And God and His wisdom and His... His, his power, His love, and His grace, He must think, what did you expect would happen? You know, it's like that old saying, if you play with fire, don't be surprised if you get burned. Oh, you heard that? You know, if we're involved with crime, we shouldn't be surprised if we end up in jail. If we don't study in school for the big test, we shouldn't be surprised if we fail the exam. If we don't take care of ourselves, we shouldn't be surprised if we find ourselves in poor health. And you say, well, that all makes sense, Pastor. Well, so too does this. If we don't seek to be in agreement with God, we shouldn't be surprised when we have to face the consequences for not being in agreement with God. You know, there's something that we often forget, and it's sad that we forget it as Americans, but it's even more sad that we forget it as Christians. And I want you to make sure that you hear this, right? But we often forget that God is God. It's his opinions that matter. It's his thought that counts. It's his decisions that are final. You know, I know there's probably lots of people lining up thinking, well, when I go to heaven and God says, no, you can't come in, they'll say, well, I have my attorney and we want to file an appeal. And we shouldn't laugh about it. But that's what people think. Oh, I'll talk my way out of it. We play games where we say to, say to ourselves, look, I know what the Bible says. I know what it says, but times have changed. People have changed. I know what the Bible says, but I disagree. And you know, there it is, you know. That's the problem that we all so often face. I disagree with God. Well, folks, the next logical thought is, I disagree with God, and I am right. <laughs> you know, because that's normally how it is. If I disagree, you know, it's because I know that I'm right. But guess what? I'm not. 
Guess what? You aren't. Guess what? We aren't. Even if the rest of your friends say you're right, even if the rest of your family says you're right, even if the rest of your community or your co-workers or your political party or your state or your nation or the world, even if all the other almost 8 billion people on the face of this planet, even if we could somehow have some unanimous vote on something, if we all disagree with God, it is still wrong. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves, I will hear from heaven. If we agree with God, we can enter into dialogue. We can communicate, and he will communicate with us. The question is, are we willing to do that? Are we willing to contract our wings and to let God be God. Because if we aren't, then like the people in 2 Chronicles, we as individuals and we as a nation, we will face the consequences. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you so very much for this opportunity to look at your word. We thank you for the truth of it and the power of it. And Father, we do pray for our nation. We do humbly come before you uh, this morning asking that you would work in this nation, that you would touch hearts, that you would change lives, that you would change communities, that you would turn us back to you. In fact, that you would give us the desire in our hearts to return to you. Father, you are so good and you are so patient. And though we know that your goodness is not limited, we know that your patience is that someday the time will run out. And we pray as a nation, we pray as a church, we pray as families, and we pray as individuals here today, Lord, that we would have an attitude of humility before you, recognizing that you are God, and recognizing that you are in control, and that we have a desire to communicate with you and to allow you to communicate with us. We pray that if we find places of disagreement, that you would speak to our hearts, Lord, and help us to understand the truth according to your word. We pray, too, Lord, that if there are any here today that have not yet accepted Christ as their Savior, that they've not made that choice yet, that you would speak to their heart, and as we have our time of response, that you would encourage them to make that choice this day, and we would celebrate with them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As you, as you stand as we have our time for uh, response, I do want to share with you some exciting news that we have had two people who've requested church membership, and uh, oh, it's R&R &R time, I guess. Robin Spice and Rebecca Linda, Linder have both requested to join, uh, and so apparently I haven't scared them off yet, and so do make sure to get around and greet them, but if you'll stand as we have our song of response, and as we prepare for communion. Thank mm -hmm. you.
believe Mr. Adams is going to offer our our communion prayer. And again, you don't have to be a member of First Baptist Church to participate in communion. You don't have to be a Baptist to participate in communion. But you do have to be able to say that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. So if you claim Christ as your Lord, we invite you and encourage you and would celebrate if you would share communion with us today as we celebrate the unity that we have as brothers and sisters in Christ. Mr. Adams. Dear God, we come before you today and we thank you so much for the blessings that you've bestowed on our country and on each and every one of us. Lord, we, we continue to look to you and that you guide our lives. Help us to take this communion in the spirit that you sent it to us. The breaking of your body and the sharing of your blood for our remission of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray. Father God, it is with hearts that are humbled that we come before you this morning. Thankful for what you've done. And we make the choice, Lord, to see you as our God. To see you as our Savior. To see you as our Lord. We place ourselves under your authority for your glory. We give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name, amen.
Again, we pray. Lord, we are mindful that the bread is symbolic of the breaking of your body. Lord, we realize that the juice, the cup, is symbolic of the shedding of your blood. And just at this moment, we reflect on the truth that we are instructed to do this in remembrance of Christ. And so today, as we reflect upon the freedom and the liberty that we have in these United States, the political freedom, we think, too, of that greater spiritual freedom that Christ has won for us. And again, we say thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now, if you'll stand as we have our closing chorus. Before we sing that, I just want to just say one other thing. Um, for quite a while, we had one lady that made our communion bread, Patricia Talbot. She did it for quite a while, and she's not able to do it anymore. So I just wanted to say a big thank you to her. Those of you that like our communion bread, feel free to thank her. And those of you that don't like our communion bread, you may also thank her. But, but let's sing God Bless America. opportunity throughout this day and this week to think about the truth of who you are and how we can humbly approach you and relate to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.